Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. My name is uh, Charlie King, and uh, my people are the Gurindji people. They might be streaming in and listening. We hope so. Nice to see you all here. Uh, it's my privilege to be your MC, MC for this evening's Docker, Dr. Mickey uh, Dewar's oration presented by the National Archives of Australia. This evening you'll hear from the newly appointed National Archives Director General Simon Froude, followed by Ms Pat Turner, who's with us tonight. She's, she will deliver the oration. So be prepared, ladies and gentlemen, to be uh, inspired and challenged. We're looking forward to that. <laughs> Following the oration, there will be a 15 to 20 minute uh, to put aside for questions. There should be a copy of the program on your seats there. The oration is being streamed live and will also be available on the National Archives website uh, a little later on. The streaming will be focused on the speakers this evening and the Q&A only your voices will be recorded. Uh, before we commence the formal program for this evening, a few pieces of housekeeping. You know all these things. Uh, please check that your mobiles are switched to silent or off. Toilets are located outside the main entrance of the foyer, opposite the lifts there on level four. In the event of an emergency, please follow the directions of the legislative, uh, legislative assembly staff. Emergency signs are well posted around the venue. Uh, to formally uh, commence proceedings, I'd like to introduce Ms Phyllis Williams, Director of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Engagement, to deliver the welcome to country. Uh, Philip is a, uh, Phyllis is a Larrakia Gomulkban woman and she leads the National Archives Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Engagement section, bringing the archives to our people uh, on their terms. Phyllis. Good evening, Claire Martin, AO, Dr Denver Beanland, Chair, National Archives of Australia, Simon Fruit, Director General, National Archives of Australia, Maisie Austin and Margaret Ferber, National Archives of Australia, Northern Territory Aboriginal Advisory Group. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Lara Keir from my mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, and ancestors before them. I pay my respects to them and Larrakia elders past, present and emerging. I acknowledge elder statesmen and women, community elders, countrymen and women from other parts of the Territory and Australia. I also acknowledge all peoples from other parts of the world and Australia here tonight. We are gathered today on the land of the Larrakia people, which includes Darwin and the surrounding areas across to Cox Peninsula and down to Gunpoint. Now, being on Larrakia country, all of us here tonight, we're enmeshed in many ways. Anyone who has a connection to Darwin, the land, living and working here or visiting, we are sharing our histories and we're doing this tonight. My father was born under a tree at Wurrawu by the ocean on the Coburg Peninsula. The offspring of the tree are still growing there and I'm connected there to family, country, language, songs and ceremony and those connections are unbroken. My mother too was born under a tree at Bullocky Point, here in Darwin. And I'm connected there with family through Larrakia connections, to, though Larrakia connections to country, language, songs and ceremony have been broken, washed over, questioned or diminished because of non-Indigenous settlement. Yet despite this, my family and we Larrakia are still here and we are revitalising our connections. Our historical collections, connections, collections and archives are so very important and vital to us, all of us, me and you, individually for our communities, our society at many different levels, connecting us to family and country, and for providing evidence for truth-telling, sovereignty, 
self-determination and voice. The fingerprints, crosses, marks, images, voices and stories of my family and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are in the National Archives of Australia and assisting me, my family and Larrakia people. There is still a way to go. Now to everyone here, I hope that Darwin as your home or as a place you're visiting will be within a thoughtful and caring community and that you receive or take away something of benefit and nurturing from being on Larrakia country. In line with this year's Reconciliation Week theme, be brave, make change. Let's all do this together, not just this week, do this every day, every week, every year, every time. So everyone, welcome. Welcome to Gwalwa Daraniki, Larrakia, Gulumbiringan country. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Phyllis. Uh, we commit to walk with the greatest respects on the lands of the Larrakia people. Thanks for that welcome to country. Uh, I'd like to welcome and acknowledge our special guest, ladies and gentlemen, for this evening's oration, Dr. Richard, uh, David Ritchie, husband of Dr. Mickey Dewar and family. Welcome, nice to have you here. Dr. Denver Beanland. That's a great name, it's Dr. Denver, Be oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just like, Mr. Denver Beanland. Uh, Chair of the National Archives Advisory Council, Maisie Austin is with us. Maisie, great to see you here. And Margie Ferber with you as well. Great to see you both both here. Uh, NT Aboriginal Advisory Group you're part of from the National Archives of uh, Australia. And of course, the freshly appointed uh, Doctor Gen uh, Director General of the National Archives, Mr Simon Pr uh, Prude is with us tonight. Great to see you here. Simon comes from the National Archives from South Australia. His previous role was being Director of State Records of South Australia. In this role, he was responsible for overseeing records and uh, archival management, freedom of information and uh, privacy across the South Australian public sector. An important achievement by Simon, State Records and in partnership with the South Australian State Library was the establishment of the first South Australian Aboriginal Reference Group established to develop responses to the uh, International Council on Archives uh, Tendania Adelaide uh, Declaration and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Library Information and Resource Network Protocols. Now over to you, Simon. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, and thank you, Phyllis, for the welcome to country. Um, never fails to um, give, me, give me goosebumps when I listen to your talk, so thank you. Uh, it's a privilege to be welcome to your country, especially during Reconciliation Week. I'd like to extend our welcome to the distinguished guests and dignitaries who have joined us tonight. It's a great honour to welcome Miss Claire Martin Ao, who delivered the inaugural Dr Mickey Dewar oration in 2018. Welcome. I'd also like to thank everybody who's joining us online today and uh, either watching this currently or in the future from the National Archives website. Reconciliation Week is an apt time for this oration. Mickey Dew was deeply committed to reconciling the past in a path to our shared future, particularly through the active use of archives, which is reflected in the work of the National Archives of Australia that we strive to do today. I'm a strong believer that archives must be a force for positive change, a belief that resonates with the theme for National Reconciliation Week, Be Brave, Make Change. The National Archives is committed to delivering services to our First Nations people, in a manner that aligns with their needs and their culture. The National Archival Collection holds many important records documenting the individual and collective histories of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and their contribution to the history of this nation. For more than 25 years, following consultation with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and organisations, National Archives has offered tailored reference services to assist people to access the National Archival Collection. This access can be for a range of purposes, including to link up with family and community, to connect to country, and currently for redress and stolen wages. Phyllis, I understand you started with National Archives specifically to address the recommendations of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody, and to negotiate a memorandum of understanding for access to records by Northern Territory Aboriginal peoples who had been impacted by government removal policies. 
Under this memoranda, the National Archives Northern Territory Aboriginal Advisory Group was formed and has been in place actively working with National Archives since 1997. And I'm pleased to have here two members of that group tonight. We also have memoranda for access with Aboriginal peoples in Victoria and South Australia with IATSIS and a new one in development in Western Australia. I'd just like to take, to take a moment, if I may, um, just to acknowledge the recent passing of Antti, who was on the Northern Territory Aboriginal Advisory Group from 2007 to 2017, and her significant contributions to archival issues related to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Our exhibition, education, events, web and publication programmes foster understanding and respect through the sharing of voices, stories and perspectives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. We safeguard and secure and carefully and respectfully manage our collections related to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultural sensitivities, peoples and communities. We respect protocols related to handling, storage and access and the use of images and information relating to peoples. We also work to identify and correctly describe records with First Nations content, including country, names and language. And we prioritise First Nations records for preservation to ensure accessibility today and for future generations. But we can do better. In fact, we must do better and we will do better. National Archives is committed to the Tandanya Adelaide Declaration, which calls on archives of the world to acknowledge, adopt and take immediate action to embrace indigenous worldviews and methods of creating, sharing and preserving valued knowledge. Open the meaning of public archives to indigenous, indigenous interpretations and the remodelling of traditional archival principles. The declaration is an important document guiding all archives on how to manage archives and provide services in ways that meet the needs and expectations of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across Australia. I am committed to ensuring that National Archives will be a force for positive change. We will play an ever-increasing role in setting to rights the injustices of our nation's past, particularly the treatment of First Nations people and others impacted by government policy. The National Archives has already commenced work on its response to the Declaration, establishing an engagement programme that encompasses a section dedicated to delivering this work, which is ably led by Phyllis and her growing team. This section has developed the Our Way Protocols, which sets out how National Archives will work to ensure its programmes and services are developed and delivered in a culturally appropriate manner. As we build towards an expansion and elevation of our engagement programmes with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, we also recognise that there is still much that must be done. Connecting the work that we do now to the shared promise of the future means that National Archives must actively work for continued and sustained improvement. To do this, we need to improve our engagement with First Nations people, to listen to their voices and to learn from their experiences, their history and their culture. I look forward to working with Phyllis, Denver and Louise and all of the archives team to meet our commitments. On this beautiful Darwin evening, it is my pleasure to be part of the National Archives Dr Mickey Dewar Oration. The Oration is a National Archives of Australia lifelong programme in honour of Dr Mickey Dewar, long-term member of the National Archives Advisory Council. Dr. Dewar served on the National Archives Advisory Council for three terms, from 2008 to 2014, and then from 2015 to 2017. She was a highly valued member of the Council and contributed a comprehensive knowledge and passion for Australian history. Dr. Dewar was also a re recipient and then judge of the National Archives Frederick Watson Fellowship and actively addressed major council issues such as amendments to the Archives Act in 2009, which allowed for record access period advancement from 30 to 20 years. Dr. Dewar worked and published in Northern Territory history for 30 years, with two of her books shortlisted for the New South Wales Premier's History Awards for Community and Regional History. In 1998, she also received the Jesse Litchfield Award for Literature. And in 2011, she won the Northern Territory History Book Award for the book Darwin, No Place Like Home. This oration is held biennially. The inaugural oration was held on the 29th of August, 2018. And despite best efforts of the National Archives team to host again in 2020, COVID delayed the second event until this evening. I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Mickey Dewar's family who are here this evening. Dr. David Ritchie and son Sam. Dr. Ritchie continues Mickey's support for the National Archives and we appreciate that, thank you. 
Thank you everyone for attending this evening. And Charlie, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Simon, and welcome to the National Archives of Australia. It's now my pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce our orator for this evening, Ms Pat Turner. Pat Turner AM of uh, Gadanji Aranda Heritage has worked as a civil administrator for policies which guarantee the right to self-determination for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. I've known of Pat, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for many years and was always and have always been amazed at her energy and commitment uh, in advocating for Indigenous Australians. Her achievements are extraordinary. And I know Pat will not want me to go through all of them, but I think you need to know what a formidable person we have, we have with us this evening. So, Pat, I'm apologising in advance. In 2016, she was appointed CEO of the National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisations. Over the past two years, Pat has been front and centre advocate, ad, advocating for the rights of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities to manage their own COVID-19 responses. If that challenge wasn't enough, in November 2019, Ms Turner was appointed by Ken White, former Minister for Indigenous Affairs, to be one of the 20 members of the uh, senior advisory group uh, to guide the co-design of the Indigenous Voice to Parliament. In July 2020, Ms Turner participated in the National Archives Constitution Day Reform, a uh, day, day forum rather, with uh, Associate Professor Paul Sanziuk and Professor Kim uh, Rubenstein with the topic Constitution during a crisis, who's responsible, with a focus on the COVID-19 pandemic and state-federal relations. Ms Turner has had an extraordinary public career joining the Department of Interior, the Welfare Branch, in early 1970s and then becoming part of the newly formed Department of Aboriginal Affairs back in 1972. She was awarded the Order of Australia in 1990 for her public service, her achievements in and out of the Australian public service are extensive and include, but not limited to, Vice President of the Federal Council of the Advancement of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in 1976, in 1989 Deputy Secretary Department of Aboriginal Affairs, Secretary in the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet during 1991-92 with oversight of the establishment of the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation and with responsibility for the Office of the Status of Women. CEO of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, which made her the most senior Indigenous government official in Australia in 1994 through to 1998. And in 1998 to 1999, she held the chair of the Australian Studies at the Georgetown University of Washington, DC was inaugural chief, exec uh, chief executive officer of the National Indigenous Television Service and is co-chair of the Joint Council in Closing the Gap. She deserves a really big welcome from you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Pat Turner. Thank you very much, Charlie, and thank you, Phyllis, for your warm uh, and enlightening welcome to country. Welcome everybody. My name is Pat Turner and I am honoured to deliver this year's Mickey Dewar oration. I am the CEO of the National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation. I also have the privilege of being elected the first lead convener of the Coalition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Community Controlled Peak Organisations. Foremost, I am Aboriginal. I am the daughter of an Aranda man and a Gadanji woman and I grew up in Alice Springs. Being Aboriginal and of the first peoples of this country is my story, the story of who I am. <clears throat> I extend my warmest regards to Mickey's husband, Dr David Ritchie and her family. I acknowledge the stories of Mickey's family life. Welcome also to Simon Fruit and Phyllis Williams and others from the National Archives, especially uh, the Chairman. I acknowledge the national storage that you gather and protect as part of your work. Mickey Dewar was a storyteller. She understood that the stories of our nation needed to be told so that, as a country, we could understand where we have come from and who we are. Mickey knew that for us to move forward as a more reconciled and modern nation, 
The stories of our past needed to be told. Mickey's work. I'm just going to move this mic. I'm sorry, it's in my way. So is that still clear? Okay, sorry. Um, Mickey's work led to the stories of many Aboriginal people being told and some of our history being recognised. This evening, I want to talk to you about the importance of Aboriginal storytelling and how it shapes the nation and our own cultures and identities. Aboriginal people are the original storytellers. Telling stories is both a cultural practice of who we are as peoples and is a way in which we sustain our identities and lands. To begin tonight's story, I pay my respects to the Larrakia elders, past and present. We are gathering on the land of the Larrakia people and I thank them for their continuing openness to have so many of us live, work and meet on their land. As Phyllis said, Larrakia country runs from the Cox Peninsula in the west, to Gun Point in the north, to Adelaide River and down to Mountain Dam southwards. The Larrakia people established the first trade routes in the region, trading with the Tiwi, Wagat and the Wulnu people as well as with Indonesian fishermen. Their stories, songs and ceremonies echo the strong connection and understanding they have with the saltwater country. Acknowledgement of country, now a welcoming convention in Australia, is born of an ancient cultural ritual of our peoples relating to the regulation of visitors on country. These cult this cultural process has always been an important element of Aboriginal societies across different First Nations, language groups and clans for thousands of years. It is a practice born of recognition, relatedness and reciprocity. Recipro I always get stuck on that, I'm sorry. Uh, between our nation groups. Uh, if we were crossing into someone else's country, if you were crossing into someone else's country, it was a requirement to send a request to the owners to be granted permission to enter and, off, and be offered safe passage and protection. In turn, the visitor agreed to acknowledge, adhere to, and respect the rules of the country that was being entered. Vital information could also be shared between nations about how and where to access food and water and protect the country you were travelling on. Whilst the way in which this protocol is expressed between our peoples has changed since colonisation, the sentiment and practice has never disappeared. For Aboriginal peoples, the practice continues to inform how we introduce ourselves to each other and how we relate to each other. Importantly, the practice is a way of knowing ourselves. For Aboriginal people, country is fundamentally about identity. It embodies our spirituality, language, family, ancestral connection and law. Continuing to tell the story of our place, of our country, maintains the story of our connection to who we are as Aboriginal peoples and where we come from. The acknowledgement of country as part of mainstream Australian practice has additional important storytelling benefits. The first is the story of acknowledgement and respect and learning that is required from the settlers. To undertake an acknowledgement of country, Australians need to research and learn who are the original owners and inhabitants of the land they are on. Whether they like it or not, in performing an acknowledgement of country, Australians are learning part of the stories of the past and are speaking to our ongoing connection to country into the present. 
By bringing our story into the present, the second benefit that an acknowledgement of country speaks to is the brutal dispossession of our peoples, including of my own peoples, for which reparations are yet to be made. It is a political act that, because of the lack of equity and justice for, First Nations, for its First Nations peoples, talks to an unreconciled nation. It is not surprising then, it is not surprising that some have traced and linked the modern resurgence of the acknowledgement of country to the land rights era of the 70s and 80s. It doesn't matter what lines have been drawn over the country by the settlers, the markings of states and territories and the calling of our rivers and mountains by different names, an acknowledgement of country tells the story that underneath the Whitefella map of this nation, there is an old map that still speaks and is yet to be properly, properly recognised or accounted for. Within the stories of Aboriginal peoples and without the contribution of historians and storytellers like Mickey, there would be no land rights for our peoples. When the British arrived, they sought to erase our stories through their own story of terra nullius, land belonging to no one. British colonisation and subsequent Australian land laws were established on the claim that Australia was terra nullius, effectively denying First Nations peoples land rights. The British story was that we were uncivilised, had no political or social organisation and no settled communities and ownership of land and justified acquisition of our countries without treaty or payment. Over time, and through the continual telling of our stories, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have reclaimed some of our country back. The stories have confirmed that, in fact, we have had, we have had, we had and have organised societies, political structures, that we own and care for our lands and continue to maintain a spiritual connection to our country. Laws like the Aboriginal Land Rights Act in the Northern Territory and the Native Title Act have provided the platform for our stories to be told and heard, often for the first time. While some of our stories have been heard, there is still a way to go. As we look forward, Australia continues to grapple with the story of terra nullius and the subsequent lack of a treaty. Australia is the only English settler state without a legally binding treaty with its First Peoples. A treaty would radically reshape the relationship between First Nations peoples and other Australians, beginning with an acknowledgement of a simple story, that sovereignty of this land was never ceded. A treaty would provide the opportunity for First Peoples, First Nations peoples and the Australian state to speak to one another and to tell their stories for the first time as sovereign to sovereign. A treaty is about settling the account of the past, ensuring the telling of Abri the Aboriginal perspective and developing a shared story for the future. As momentum build in Australia builds towards treaties, including for a national treaty as a part of the Uluru Statement from the Heart, and here in the Northern Territory, the importance of our Aboriginal storytelling is paramount. The storytellers here tonight and those that help to protect and preserve our stories all have a role to play. It is the Aboriginal stories of our livelihoods, cultures and connections to land that will be the foundation of treaties. And it is the stories of our past that will bring about a more reconciled future 
where Australia can both acknowledge the periods of colonial conflict and dispossession, as well as the strength and resilience of First Nations peoples and cultures. For Aboriginal peoples, storytelling is part of who we are, and it is also what sustains us as First Nations peoples with unique and distinct identities and cultures. Our storytelling is a way to instil a knowledge of the mind, body and soul in connection to the earth. There are stories that teach values, family histories, significant events, relationships and cultural beliefs. And there are sacred stories that tell about the world and its creation. The life lessons and perspective brought about in Aboriginal storytelling are essential for our peoples to make sense of the world and to shape and sustain our cultural identity. Over time, whilst the purpose of storytelling remains the same, the way in which Aboriginal peoples tell stories has changed. From the beginning, our stories would be guided by the earth and the sky. The sky and the stars inform our creation stories and also tell us about the changing seasons, weather patterns and availability of food and water sources. These stories were shared as a part of daily conversation around campfires through paintings and other artefacts and through dedicated ceremonies. As innate storytellers, Aboriginal peoples have used the opportunities of, a new storytelling, of new storytelling platforms as they have been developed. As media started to impact significantly on our peoples, we knew that we needed to get some control over how we were portrayed and to speak to our own peoples. We also knew there was an opportunity to help preserve our languages and cultures through the broader telling of our stories in our own languages and ways. In, 19, in 2007, NITV started beaming out across the bush from an office in Alice Springs, a long fought for milestone in modern Aboriginal storytelling was reached, a national indigenous television service. NITV, is about Aboriginal peoples telling Aboriginal stories in control of how their images are portrayed and sharing our cultures, languages and histories with each other. I was privileged to be the first CEO of NITV, bringing together more than 25 years of campaigning by Aboriginal peoples in that first broadcast. Before television, Aboriginal peoples drew on radio to share our stories. In 1972, the first Aboriginal produced community radio program went to air in Adelaide. Around the same time in Alice Springs, the movement that saw the establishment of the Central Australian Aboriginal Media Association, KARMA, began. Aboriginal radio, right across the country, has now become a vital forum to give voice to our stories. Using radio and television to tell our stories gives Aboriginal peoples a strong voice in the development of country, culture, politics and education. It also helps to arrest cultural disintegration, reconnect Aboriginal people that have lost parts of their identity and empower people and bring inspiration to our lives. In 2016, as a part of its 40th anniversary celebrations, the Central Land Council published Every Hill Got a Story that journalist Paul Daly, Daly reminded us of last Friday in his article and about which he said, these are recollections of 127 Aboriginal men and women. And he went on to say, it provides a broad sweep of personal history 
that bequeaths a profound gift to the national memory. <coughs> a growing group of young Aboriginal people are now taking to TikTok to tell their stories and the stories of Aboriginal peoples. Through TikTok, Aboriginal young peoples are celebrating and reconnecting and with their identities and languages. They are also using the platform to advocate for social justice, for our stories to be heard on a national scale. It might surprise you, but I am too old for TikTok. <laughs> the stories I grew up with, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> I should have brought it over. Sorry. The stories I grew up with were told under big gum trees, out on porches, sometimes lying in swags and looking up to the stars. From my mother and father, I learnt the story of my family and about their country. And from my extended family, I heard the stories of the fight for civil rights of Aboriginal people. Both these stories helped to shape who I am today. They gave me my sense of what it means to be an Aboriginal person and instilled a fire in me to imagine and work towards a better future for our people. It is vital that Aboriginal stories are protect, projected and protected for the survival of our peoples as First Nations peoples with distinct cultures and identities. As Aboriginal people embrace new ways of telling their stories, with a nation starting to show more openness to hear our stories, we need to, be better, we need to better consider the question of intellectual property rights. Our people's intellectual property rights extend to include a wide range of subject matter beyond what is recognised within existing intellectual property rights and other protection systems within Australia. Our intellectual property is closely linked to land, cultural heritage and environment, and also to cultural property, also expressed through our stories. Aboriginal knowledge, creative expressions, innovations and stories are also owned and transmitted communally and are tightly integrated into all other aspects of society. These features are at odds with conventional Western notions of intellectual property and are not being protected by Australian copyright laws. Meanwhile, a growing body of declarations, statements and other developments, both within the United Nations and its agencies and by Indigenous peoples around the world, calls attention to the unique features of First Nations intellectual property systems and provides potential opportunities for countries to introduce measures to recognise and protect these. This must be a priority for the, in for the incoming Australian Government. Just another one. <laughs> <clears throat> All of us here today can contribute to the protection and preservation of our stories making sure that Aboriginal stories are heard as we want them told and that re they remain our stories to tell. The National Archives has and continues to play a vital role in the protection and preservation of our stories whilst respecting our intellectual property. The stories held by National Archives have been valuable in native title claims, language revival and history writing and essential in reconnecting current generations to those who have passed. Mickey Dewar, who we are honouring tonight, knew the importance of stories and of Aboriginal stories. She knew that the telling of the stories of our past would help create a more reconciled, honest future something Aboriginal peoples are searching for. Thank you, Mickey, and thank you to her family 
for giving me the honour of telling a story to you tonight. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pat, for that uh, fascinating, uh, fascinating story. Thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll now open the floor to questions. We have uh, quite a bit of time left, probably 10, 15 minutes. If you have some questions you want to share now, uh, please, uh, we'll take uh, those microphones around, but state your name, keep the question brief and wait to be handed the microphone before asking your question so that we can capture the question for streaming. That's the streaming camera over there. So uh, put your hand up if you want to take a microphone and ask, the, ask a question. The question can be directed to Pat. Question over there. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Louis Winchester, Charles Darwin University. I'd be interested to know if you have positive suggestions about changing the intellectual property legislation because it's something that the university grapples with as well? Oh, I would imagine that some of the brains at the university uh, would be better than mine. Um, so no, I don't, but there are some good uh, Aboriginal experts like Terry Jenke, uh, for example, who has done a lot of work in this area and uh, much more knowledgeable than I. Uh, she's written quite a number of articles. I don't know whether you're familiar with her work. Terry Janke. Uh, so, J-A-N-K-E. Um, and, uh, and Terry is a woman. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> but it's definitely an area that deserves the uh, unpicking and putting back together. And I think some of the international writings... Uh, on this from other Indigenous groups around the world uh, would be informative as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Pat, thank you uh, for your comments. Um, Tim Barnett and I work in the building here. Um, we're at an <coughs> extraordinary point in Australian history yeah. and if it's possible to look forward and tell a story, what would you want the story of this government to be in relation to the issues that you're focusing on? Uh, well, I would want this government to make uh, the right commitments to close the gap. I mean, the living conditions uh, across the board in terms of our um, health status, our um, educational achievements, uh, the state of our housing, uh, environmental health issues, uh, our children getting the best possible start in life. I mean, that's where my... I'm a service delivery, you know, uh, person. Uh, I want practical changes and a better life for our people to enjoy where they live. Um, and... Uh, you know, I understand a lot of, there's a lot of uh, challenges, but I keep on saying we're less than a million people, for goodness sake. Why is there so much bureaucracy and rules and red tape uh, uh, in this space when Aboriginal communities and Aboriginal community controlled organisations, we know, deliver better services than mainstream? We know we need mainstream, so we need to minimise the role of mainstream. Uh, and make it more culturally respectful and culturally safe. Um, I do agree um, that uh, the implementation of the Uluru Statement from the Heart, we've always supported that, the Coalition of Peaks. Um, but I also think that truth-telling needs to be the first cab off the rank in that, because I think that will create a, a much greater understanding. But, you know, their intent on doing the voice, I mean, I was 10 years involved with the constitutional... Um, Centenary Foundation from the 90s to 2000 and uh, you know I know uh, a fair bit about the Australian constitutional system and how hard it is to change the constitution itself um, so they're going to have a mighty 
battle on their hands to get the number of the majority of votes in the majority of states uh, on a yes vote, to get the voice uh, as a voice to parliament, not just to the government, uh, which was what Ken was proposing. And Ken was proposing a voice uh, with regional voices and, you know, some people being appointed by him. Uh, and that's not what we're about these days. We're about our own people choosing our own representatives uh, because we believe we know who can best speak for us on particular topics. Um, so I'd really like to have a um, whole of government approach to closing the gap with the Albanese government. I've met with him and I'm in fact meeting with his uh, senior staff next week. Um, and I want to impress upon them the importance of doing that because so many departments are siloed and if you understand, and, and many of you would, living in the Territory and being interested in coming along to a lecture or Mickey's oration tonight, understand Aboriginal issues and you know that we never see things single, in a single, you know, uh, lens. We have a holistic approach to life. Our culture is based on uh, everything being interconnected. And so it's really hard to get bureaucrats and ministers to understand, mate, it's not that important that you hold the cheque up and seem to be the one handing it out. What's important is the changing of the life on the ground, uh, that that investment is going to help if you work across portfolios in a more streamlined and... Uh, and better way. So sorry to take such a long time, but closing the gap and the improving the service delivery to my people at the local community level is where my heart lies. Thank you so much. I'm so thrilled to actually be in the room with you. I've just awed at you on TV for years. Um, my name's Ursula and I'm just wondering, so your oration tonight has been framed around storytelling and it's the National Archives oration. I'm wondering, do you have a story of when the archives has assisted you with policy formation or advocacy? Um, well, not myself directly, but uh, a close friend of mine who now has passed away um, had a lot of support from the archives when she wrote her book, um, and uh, about the stolen generations and was one of the biggest agitators for the stolen gen. He, she was, you know, my best friend who lived here in Darwin and I wrote the foreword to her book um, because my mum was stolen generation and, and was sent to Carlin Compound with her sister and then the Retta Dixon family, you know, the kids came along later. So there's a connection between Carlin and Retta Dixon um, but also with all of the other places. You know, my uncles, uh, my mother's brothers, were sent to uh, Garden Point. They were separated from the girls. The girls came to Carlin. They went to the Catholic mission at uh, Garden Point. Um, and uh, my father was uh, in Alice Springs at the bungalow. So helping uh, my friend with all of her research uh, was very, very close, you know, uh, exercise uh, doing that uh, with her. She did it, but, you know, she had to have someone to bounce things off of, and that was me, unfortunately, or fortunately. Um, so, I mean, I've often would have liked to have had the time to go back and research a bit on my mother's side, because my mother comes from inland of Borolula, um, and... Uh, and the Gadangi people there, and uh, they were, she and her sister were removed by police on horseback and taken overland to Mataranka and chucked on the train and sent to Carlin, at, you know, like that big. Um, and never... Um, uh, we found her mother at Tanambrini Station in 1978, I think it was, me and my two brothers. And then we went home and told Mum that we found Nana. And the next year we sent her to Darwin here, to my uncles, because uh, they'd gone down and picked Nana up and 
and that was the first time Mum had seen her since she was a little girl. And, uh, you know, so we live with those stories and we know them all too well. And we can recount from all the families, you know, Paddo's mum and, and all of these people have all been through this. Um, and, you know, anyone in the front row uh, can tell you stories that are similar. But we know the value of archives. We know what a gem Phyllis is. And, uh, and her commitment to archives has just been absolutely extraordinary. And when she was speaking today, I thought, gee, she'll be given a good, or good oration in a couple of years. <laughs> <coughs> so thank you. Thank you. <coughs> uh, just, um, yes. uh, Pat, um, just on behalf of the family, I would like to... We, we're deeply honoured to have you here and it's a wonderful, a wonderful oration. And just as a question, I mean, just for, you know, budding historians, is there anything that you think is, would really be worth somebody looking at that hasn't really been done, you know, in, in the spirit of using the records that are there? What, what, is there any area that you think really should be, should be looked at that hasn't really been, been looked at? Well, it's funny, uh, and it might seem a strange thing for me to say, but I think the relationship between the Afghan Cameleers and Aboriginal people is an underdone story. Um, and because uh, there's so much of a relationship between Aboriginal people, and it's not just here, it's in WA too, isn't it, Rob, from up your country in the Kimberley. And, you know, as you go down the coast, I think they worked on the railway there too. There's all these palm trees, like there are in the centre, that were planted by the Afghans for the dates. Um, but there's a rich history there that I don't think has been properly uh, explored. And it'd be lovely to do that through Aboriginal lens and uh, to share those family stories, because there's a lot of intermarriage. Mm. And thank you. Uh, it's my great honour, honestly, to... Uh, to be able to deliver the oration tonight. I'm very honoured, and thank you. Oh, uh, Rob, sorry. Thanks, Pat. Um, Rob McPhee, uh, I'm from Danila Dilby Health Service. Pat, um, given data is one of the priority reform areas of Close the Gap, and there are a lot of stories and photos and all sorts of stuff in archives, What's your view in the future around data sovereignty and where does that information belong? Well, um, it's the same as cultural keeping places. And um, um, so I think that uh, where the community wants to have the information, it should definitely be shared with them. Um, and, but if they want to remove everything, without leaving copies or originals. Well, I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, I think that government has never resourced the collections area properly, ever, right? Now, let me talk about the repatriation of human remains. So I went to Fitzroy Crossing and they have shipping containers at, in the yard at an organisation with our people's human remains in them because the government hasn't got the money to help with the proper reburial of those human remains. That is an absolute national disgrace, in my opinion. When they started to repatriate stuff from museums, collections, back to country, I mean, fair enough with secret, sacred stuff, but the Australo Museum in Alice Springs now is so full it can't take any more material, you know. And some of the artefacts are so fragile and so rare and whatever, you really have to have a proper uh, storage environment, you know. Uh, so archives is exactly the same, even probably more difficult to store paper and film, and or you've got the film archives, but, you know, 
what the work that the National Archives does. Um, so I think it's great to have access. And you can get access, just ring Phyllis and she'll organise. <laughs> um, won't you, darling? <laughs> yes. And, uh, but it should definitely be shared because the sharing of data and information is the fourth priority reform in the Closing the Gap Agreement, one of the four structural priority reforms that we're going for. We're not too worried about the stupid targets that the governments want um, because they never meet them, you know. And that's why in this new national agreement we went for four priority reforms. Shared decision-making between Aboriginal people and government, building and strengthening the Aboriginal community control sector to deliver services, because we do it better, and cheaper, um, uh, we do, and uh, reforming mainstream institutions to be more culturally respectful and uh, be culturally safe when they engage with Aboriginal people, so that's hospitals, police, corrections, out of home care for our kids, you, can, you name them. And th the fourth one is the sharing of data and information in those partnerships. So government collects all this information about Aborigines. Most of it gets from us because they fund us and we have to put reports in. But they're very clever in the way they can collate this information. So when I sit down with governments now, I say, there's nothing secret sacred about the information that you've got on us, so share it. You know, we need to know exactly what you've got and we can correct some of that because of our local knowledge. And we're also building the capacity of our own people to collect data, know how to collate it, know how to analyse it, know how to use it. So we've got a number of those, six of those projects that we're running as a part of the Close the Gap uh, thing now. But anyway, uh, does that answer you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can I sit down? Oh, Pat, I might just ask you, could I ask you one question, please? Yeah. Um, <laughs> The Northern, the Northern Territory Government has committed to building a memorial for the children of the, that were in the Carlin compound. Yeah. My, my mother and her sister were at, at that compound. And my mother and her sister were too. There. Yeah. So what, what sort of advice should we be giving them about that memorial? What sh and, and taking into mind your thoughts about truth-telling and those things, what should that memorial look like? Certainly not a plaque in the park. Oh, no. As there is now. Yeah. Down there. Yeah, so that they've, they've allocated the land and said that's where it's going to go. So I've got to tell you about that because they asked me to MC that thing when Adam Giles unveiled that plaque, remember? <laughs> <laughs> ah, were you there, Macy? <laughs> anyway, what do you... No, but let me tell you this one, Phil. Okay. <laughs> so Adam Giles was the first Aboriginal Chief Minister in the Northern Territory, a fact of which we were all very proud, even though he was CLP. And, <laughs> but he was still, you know, he made the, he made the office, you know. So I get up and I introduce him and I say, this is, you know, we've got here the Chief Minister, um, Adam Giles, and aren't we all proud he's our first Aboriginal Chief Minister? And he's going, oh, God, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I've just hammed it up. But anyway, I think that, you know, there needs to be something more substantial there. But I think that if you were creative and worked with Aboriginal media and people like Phyllis and, you know, this advisory committee, because they've got the knowledge of the records, there could be a more engaging way for people to go and sit in a place, you know, maybe, I don't know what they're building down there. I haven't driven past it since I've been up. Um, a, contemplative, a contemplative area that you can play some stories from the stolen generations themselves. Um, I think, you know, I mean, we won't necessarily have our, because so many of us have lost our parents now. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, but there's still people around who would give permission. I mean, I'd be very happy to tell a story about my mum, and I'm sure you would about yours, you know, because we want Australians and visitors and future generations, everyone, to understand that part of our history. So I would incorporate something that you could hear as well as you could sit in a contemplative area. Uh, you know, maybe, well, waters, I don't know how fountains go up here with the heat, but you know what I mean. Yeah. 
Okay. Something nice. All right. Mm. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. No worries. Okay. I think Is that, that it? I think that's it. Thank you. Is that it? No, did you have another question? Is there one more? <laughs> no. Okay. Great. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. Thank you. Phyllis, do you want to say a few? Phyllis, to say a few words. Thank you. Okay. My turn now, Pat and Charlie. Yeah. <laughs> Firstly, I'd like to um, express our thanks to Parliament House venue staff, Steve Castilian over there. Thank you very much for all your support and assistance. And then to um, Pat and Charlie, thank you both very much for being here tonight. You honour us with your thoughts and also with your presence as well. Thank you both. <laughs> and particularly for pre presenting such an important an inspiring opportunity for the National Archives to connect with Australians and to remember, in particular, Dr Mickey Dewar and her contribution to our archival heritage. And so to everyone, we look forward to seeing the seeds planted here tonight grow. And so, Pat and Charlie, what we'd like to do is to present you both with a gift from the National Archives of Australia. For you, Pat, this is a, um, so it's a copy of a hand-drawn map of Andulia. Oh, lovely. Oh, that's wonderful. So we're, so your father's country. Yes, wow. thank you very much. And for you, Charlie, this here is also a hand-drawn map of Limbanya. So, so, the place of your mother, Charlie. Thank you so especially much. Especially for you. That is wonderful. Yeah. Very thoughtful, Phyllis. Thank you. Thank you. And on that note, I'm going to hand back to Charlie as the MC. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you. Um, so, my notes read this. Uh, while the National Archives has me, I've been requested to promote the National Archives. <laughs> Unlike many national cultural institutions, the National Archives is truly national, with research centres in every state and territory, ca in every state and territory capital city. In Darwin, you can carry out research in the collections at the Northern Territory Archives Centre in Kelsey Crescent in Milner. But the National Archives is more than a collection of records. It has a national public engagement program supported by recently launched members program. It too is a national program that I encourage you to join. And lastly, it would be helpful to the National Archives teams if you could take a few moments to complete the visitors survey. Your feedback will be uh, helpful in improving future programs. Thank you ladies and gentlemen for being with us this evening. Uh, to remember and acknowledge Dr Mickey Drewer and her tremendous contribution to exploring and sharing the history of the Northern Territory as well as her commitment to the National Archives of Australia. On behalf of the National Archives and its Advisory Council, I'd like to thank Ms Pat Turner and her oration and, challenge us, uh, and challenging us all tonight. Thank you so much for that. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you.